Hello, everyone, and thank you for waiting for tonight's Ed Leaders Network live event, Unlearning Leadership. We've got Mike Lubefeld with us and Nick Poliak as well, and they're going to give us a great presentation here this afternoon. So happy all of us were able to join. Um, my name is Arlen Peebles with the Illinois Principals Association. I'll be your host and tech support guide. If you have any questions, type them into the questions box. Um, as soon as you think of them, um, those you can see there, perfect. Kathy, good, good afternoon. Thanks for joining. Um, that's where you'll be able to type to us, and I'll read the questions out loud. We're going to have time for Q&A at the end, but we want you to type your questions in as you think of them. The other panel I want you to look at is the audio panel. If you pop that open, you'll see three options. Computer audio, which most of you are set to, and you, that's how you want to stay. That's the best listening experience. But if you do lose audio at any time, you can click on phone call, and a telephone number will appear there for you to dial. So those are your two uh, options on the control panel. Uh, we appreciate you joining us, and I will now turn things over to Mike Lubefeld and Nick Poliak. Let me start the recording. How are you guys? Hey, good afternoon, Arlen. It's a pleasure to be here with you all in the IPA. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity. Hey, Arlen, uh, great to be here. Thanks so much. We're looking forward to spending some time with everybody today. All right, perfect. We've got the recording started. You guys can take it away. All right. Mike, you want to start off and introduce yourself real quick? Sure. sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Mike. I'm the superintendent of schools in North Shore School District 112 here in uh, north suburban Chicagoland area, Highland Park in Highwood, Illinois. I'm in my uh, finishing my second year as superintendent here and finishing my 10th year as a superintendent in general. Proud to be here with you. So grateful that you're choosing to spend some time with us and uh, Looking forward to talking about unlearning leadership with my good friend, Nick Poliak. Nick? Thank you, sir. Uh, just so that everybody on the webinar knows, that picture in the middle of this slide is actually a picture of Mike, and the picture on the cover of the book is a picture of me. Uh, we, uh, Mike and I are good friends and colleagues. We've been had the pleasure, been blessed to do a lot of fun work together. I serve as the superintendent for Leiden High School District 212 in suburban Chicago just outside O'Hare Airport. It's my seventh year as superintendent here. I was four years as superintendent at Illinois Valley Central in Chillicothe, Illinois, before this opportunity. And this is my 21st year in public education. So super excited to be here with you today. Um, Mike and I have, uh, we had the opportunity back a few years ago to write this book called The Unlearning Leader. And couldn't help but reflect upon the work we did back then and what's going on in our country, in our schools, and in our world right now, and the amount of unlearning that's necessary for us to navigate these waters, to, uh, to come up with new solutions to new problems. And so we, we're glad to be here today. We think this is a pretty timely topic for us to be discussing with you. One of the things we want to share, Nick, will you show them the next slide? We want to let you know that um, the, the, the slides in this slide deck and the video links that we have, uh, we hope that, that you'll find some value in after today's experience. We will show some of the videos in their full length, some we won't show at all, but we'll reference them. So if you'd like to take down the link, http uh, bit.ly eln unlearns, or just uh, take a picture of the QR code or scan it, you will have an opportunity to have full access to these slides um, and um, we're more than happy to share with you. We'll show this link and the QR code later. We'll also give you some of our contact information should you want to get in touch. Right now, let's uh, kick it off with a little bit of background about um, you know, why we're here and, and where Unlearning for us started. Yeah, Mike and I have had a chance to present across Illinois, across the country, and I think in five or six different countries on this topic. And so it's been a lot of fun for us. As we go around, we always ask everybody this one question. And so when you hear that, that phrase, unlearning leader, what does it make you think of? And so there's a question box. We want you to take a second and just write some answers and submit them in that question box. And, and Arlen is gonna read them back for us. But what does that mean to you? What does it mean to be an unlearning leader? So we're gonna give you All about right. Oh, go ahead, Arlen. Yeah, they're already coming in. Unlearning bad habits from Russia. Uh, Hillary says, out of the box thinker. Ephraim says, it means we need to re-educate ourselves. 
Uh, Bridget says, challenging the status quo, doing leadership differently, willing to take risks and move education forward, open-minded, flexible, out of the box, getting rid of the old mindset and learning a new one, someone willing to move beyond what we've always done, being open and innovative, uh, to not be stuck in what we think has to be. Uh, Mike just says innovation, alternative learning, rethinking what you previously learned. And then Nina says, I think it's a leader that doesn't stick to the traditional leadership strategies. Oh, that's, that's, that's a great, pretty good example. <clears throat> that's a great sample. Arlen, thank you. And thank you all out there um, listening and watching for, for taking the time to do that, to queue up what is an unlearning leader? An unlearning leader is all that that Arlen just read for us and, and even more. Um, the concept of unlearning certainly did not originate with us, uh, yet it's neat. And like Nick said at the top of the hour, this is a time to like unlearn and try to um, unpack some of the things that, that we know because it's really a cool opportunity to do things differently. So when did all this start for us and how did we decide that unlearning was the way to go and the message to share? Nick, do you want to tell them a little bit about that? Sure. A few years ago, Mike and I got an invitation to go to the White House. And uh, we share that with you at the beginning of the webinar because we hope that that makes you think that we're important and that you're on a webinar with some people who know what they're talking about. So that's just really establishing our, our dominance on the conversation to say we got invited <laughs> to the White House. And uh, we were at an innovation summit with educational leaders from across the country. We got to go to the US Trademark and, and Patent Office to hear about how new ideas come to pass. We got to spend time at the White House and working through workshops. And we came back from there supercharged up. And the very next day, there happened to be a Future Ready Summit in, uh, in Northern Illinois. And Mike and I both showed up there with teams from our school districts. And while we were there, we saw a video from a gentleman named Jack Aldrich. Jack is a futurist, uh, which apparently is a job you can have. And they showed us a video of Jack talking to a group of medical professionals. And he used the word unlearning. We had never really heard that phrase before. And what Jack did, uh, among other things, he told, asked us some questions to the group of people he was presenting to. And one of them really stuck with Mike and I. He asked the room, to imagine in your head what two colors make up a yield sign, the traffic sign for yield. And just ask people to raise their hand if they think yield signs are uh, yellow and black. And the majority of the hands in the room went up. And he said, congratulations, that is the correct answer, as long as you ask the question prior to 1971. Because from 1971 to today, yield signs have been red and white. The problem is, we as humans are really, really good at learning new information, but we're really bad at unlearning information that's no longer true. So if you were a person who once learned that yield signs were, were yellow and black, even though every single one you pass and have passed since 1971 looks like the red and white one, it's hard to unlearn. But Mike, Jack Aldrich, you know, we may have stolen this concept from Jack Aldrich. We learned this, Mike and I sat down and said, how can we overlay this to the world of education? What are all the things we need to unlearn about our practices to make room for the new realities? But as we come to find out, Jack stole this from someone else. Mike, where was that person? Oh my gosh, it came from a galaxy far, far away in a time long, long ago. See, as good authors, we did our research and we found in the ancient scrolls from the Jedi masters that unlearning to hold. Oh. No different, only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have there. So Yoda, as you may remember, was very, very strong in the Force. And as you remember, Luke Skywalker was a young Jedi. And at that time in his life, he was really trying to grapple with doing things. He had always learned you can pick up spaceships with, you know, a crane or with a hydraulic lift. But Yoda was teaching him use the force within your mind, unlearn what you have learned about physical strength and really use the force within you. So I know that's a little bit sci-fi geeky. Um, one of the things to share with you though, is that George Lucas 
who was an actual real kind of human being during this whole Star Wars thing back 50 odd years ago. He and his teams helped us in all sincerity unlearn the film going and the movie experience. And even today we've got the, you know, 4D, 3D, all the sound and everything. So while we get a little silly about Yoda and the Jedi, it, it has been said since the last sort of, you know, whenever that it is important to unlearn things that might be holding us back. And that's really the concept here. You know, Nick and I are proud we wrote the book. It's awesome. It's a great book and all that. We're not here to sell a book or sell you on any ideas. We're really here to pass forward the messages about unlearning so that we may create new realities. Nick, can you show them some modern time um, information about how unlearning might be necessary too? Sure, this is a headline from the New York Times, September 10, 2018. It's hard for doctors to unlearn things and that's costly for all of us. In this article, they listed all these medical practices that we know are not best practice. They said giving Pedialyte for dehydration doesn't do any better than just giving water, prescribing too many antidepressants to kids, inducing childbirth too early, which creates developmental issues, uh, taking x-rays of ankles. If you break your ankle, there are so many little bones in there. We pay the money to get the x-rays and they never reveal anything because there's too many bones. There's this long list of things. In fact, Jack Aldrich told that group of medical professionals that day, that in the medical profession, when a new idea becomes best practice, it takes 18 years for that to work its way through the medical profession. Think about that for a second. When a new idea or process becomes best practice, it takes 18 years to fully work its way through the medical field. Mike and I had that conversation and said, oh my gosh, what does that, Mike, what does that mean for schools? It's, it's really Im impactful that a child at age three is going to enter our systems in preschool. And we know research and pedagogy doing step A is correct. However, we don't do step A for 18 years. So this child is 21, possibly graduated um, college, possibly out in the career field. And then we just start doing that best practice for three-year-olds then. An entire generation misses a best practice because we as humans are sometimes wired against unlearning and we want to call us to action to break that cycle from 18 years to 18 minutes. Let's learn it. Let's actu actually do it. Well, in this example, they're doctors and we always trust doctors, right? Listen, you know, smoking a pack of Luckies is less irritating. It's toasted your throat protection against irritation against cough. Listen, if 20,000 physicians say it, I may go get a pack of Luckies and light it up. <laughs> like Mike said earlier, uh, we're not trying to sell you anything. We're here to just talk about a mindset. We want you to embody this innovative mindset that encourages and supports unlearning. And we want to really spend a lot of our time today giving you some practical examples from our work, from our experiences. And so um, I'm going to start with, uh, I want to tell you about a program in our school district. And I think it's important. You know, Mike and I are the superintendents, so we get to make some decisions and work with the Board of Education. But this idea of unlearning needs to be permissible and celebrated up and down the entire organization. So the example I want to start with is our theater program at Leiden. A few years back, actually probably about six years back now, our theater came to us and said, hey, you know, we are a predominantly Hispanic, Latinx uh, school community, but those students are very underrepresentative in our theater department. Would you mind if we tried to do a play where we double cast it and we run one cast in English and one cast in Spanish and bilingual students could be in both or they could be stage managers or production managers. And we said, yeah, let's go for it. They unlearned the traditional theater approach and they created Teatro Leiden. We started with a show called La Gringa. And uh, as you can see, there were specific times to come to see it in English or in Spanish. And when this happened, here's the impact. This is the power of unlearning. The same year that we created Teatro Leiden and ran La Gringa, we had a student named Maria who came to Leiden from Guatemala. She was the most at-risk student you could imagine. Her family lived in rural Guatemala. She had uh, three siblings, two sisters and a brother. One sister 
had gone abroad to the US, met someone and got married and stayed in the United States. Her other sister went out with her boyfriend one day in Guatemala and disappeared and the families never heard from her again. And her brother went to an, a friend's house, got into an argument and was shot and killed. Maria's parents said, we can't leave our home in Guatemala but because we're waiting to see if your sister comes back, but it's not safe for you here. So they sent her to the United States to live with her sister. And she landed in our school district as a freshman in high school, knowing no one, speaking no English and having experienced as bad of trauma as you can imagine. Her Spanish teacher freshman year said, hey, we're doing this play. I want you to take this script home and read it. And so Maria did. She came back the next day and she read uh, the Spanish script for La Gringa. She not only made the show, she was given the lead in the play. And so here, this brand new student to the US, highly traumatized, was now the star on the stage for our first Teatro Leiden show. She went on to star in four different versions of Teatro Leiden shows. She created a club here uh, called the Excellence Club, where she capitalized E-L-L, -L, and she and her friends tried to get other kids learning English into different clubs and activities. And she uh, went on to a full ride college education. She's about wrapping up college right now. She recently came back and told me she's gonna be a teacher and she wants to come teach at Leiden. And I, I, I get goosebumps every time I tell that story, but it's the power of unlearning. Our theater department saying, we've been doing it one way forever. Can we try it another way? And all I did was give permission and say, go ahead. Teatro Leiden actually ended up winning the 2018 Magna Award for the top equity program in the country from the National uh, School Board Association. Mike, should I show a little of this video? Yeah, show a little of the video and then obviously we're gonna re-show the link so if people want more, they can see it after. Yep. Oops. Or you can go back and you can show the other video. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. American School Here's Board you. Thank you. the 2018 Magna Awards, sponsored by Sodexo. This year, the focus is on equity. Our winning districts are working to remove barriers to achievement for underserved and vulnerable students. In the under 5,000 enrollment category, the Magna Awards recognize Leiden Community High School District 212 in Franklin Park, Illinois. Just south and east of Chicago O'Hare International Airport, is a high school district with an inclusive theater program called Teatro Leiden. Teatro Leiden was an idea from our theater department. They noticed that our Latino students were underrepresented in the theater program. And so they just decided to try one year to double cast a show with an English speaking cast and a Spanish speaking cast. And it took off. We came across a show called La Gringa, which was written both Spanish and English, and thought couldn't hurt to try. I think if there was no Spanish cast, I wouldn't have had the courage to go and try out in a different language, which I was still learning and practicing. I think that sentence right there, if it hadn't been for Teatro Leiden, I wouldn't have had the courage to try out in a different language. Mm -hmm. I, would, I mean, that's that's what this is about. Yeah. Um, at Leiden, two years ago, we created a new version of freshman year. And uh, this was created by a group of our teachers who really wanted to try uh, education differently. And so they created a, a four block within our high school schedule that's all interdisciplinary, all problem-based, all standards-based, and it gets kids into the community and helps them solve problems while learning their curriculum. And so here's a little taste of what CoLab is about uh, mm -hmm. for a freshman at Leiden. In the real world, we use many different skills to solve a problem. We collaborate, we communicate, we compromise, we construct. If we are always using these skills to solve problems in the real world, why not use them more in school? The CoLab is a school within a school. It's an experience where students are tackling real world problems together and applying these skills to create solutions. English, social studies, science, digital literacy, and PE teachers are working together to teach students how to identify problems, come up with solutions, and collaborate on projects. The schedule looks a little different since there's no switching classes at the sound of a bell. Instead, you learn the skills you need for each subject through unique experiences. 
there is a focus on community, the collab community, the lighting community, and the global community. In the real world, everyone has their own strengths. At Leiden, why not celebrate those and try something different? Why not spend more time in the community? Why not collaborate? Why not contribute? Why not collab? So that was just a quick video our kids put together, and I'd love to mm -hmm. tell you more if you want to know more about collab, but it's, it's changing the fabric of our schools. Kids are coming into the sophomore year with confidence and a drive to make a difference in the world. Not that we didn't have that before, but it's so different the skill set that these kids are bringing into the rest of their high school career and beyond. And I, I want to be very clear that I have no direct responsibility for this other than giving permission to a group of teachers. We created something called the Innovation Incubator, where we freed up a group of teachers that opted in from their weekly um, uh, department meetings and mm -hmm. said, just go and dream. Dream big, dream different. Bring back ideas to us, and then we'll let you try them. We'll let you scale them up. And now we're going into year three of CoLab and couldn't be more pleased. But you know, before we hear some examples from Mike, we want you to know that you are all capable of unlearning. You've been doing it forever. So we're gonna give you some examples and uh, you can think to yourself, I'm gonna read these and you're gonna answer them in your head and then Mike's gonna talk us through the correct answers. So first one, think to yourself, after eating, I need to wait 30 minutes before I can what? Mike? Swim. Although you can actually eat an Italian beef sandwich or a pizza or tofu or something while you're swimming. You can even eat kale for Kathy Kajijian if she's out there, a little shout out. So we've, we've, we can unlearn this. Nick, what other things have we been unlearning? This is going to stay in your stomach forever, Mike. Yeah, bubble gum, but it's not. Bubble gum, we think, because we don't want to be swallowing it, but we have acid in our stomach that's going to dissolve it. So you're going to be okay. Mike, if you do this, your eyes will stay this way forever. Yeah, we pretend that it will keep them crossed, but because that's really disturbing, but, but it won't because we have muscles and stuff in our eyes. All right, more seriously, according to ancient mythology, Mike, why do we have lightning? Now, this is a serious pause, kind of an emotional moment or a melodramatic moment here in the presentation. So back a long, long time ago, people had to make sense of the natural world, right? In the physical world. So people we call ancient Greeks, for example, allegedly, according to mythology, that we call mythology had to have Zeus coming down from Mount Olympus because he got angry. It may have been true, but we now believe it's something to do with electricity or science or something. Did you just say it may have been true? <laughs> hey, listen, I'm not judging. I wasn't there. Got to be open-minded. All right, how about this one, Mike? You can't sail around the world because the Earth is? Flat, and there are some flat Earthers, so I think the Earth is round because I flew around it, and remember we saw the map on the airplane, but some people believe this. Now, on a serious note, this could have been a good thing if some explorers didn't come exploring. It also could have been a bad thing for the integration of cultures and for advancement of science. So whatever your points of view are, the concept was was there for a long time. Next one. Yep. What was used in the Middle Ages if you had bad blood? Well, now it's kind of fashionable. Leeches. And I do like the old, more disturbing image, Nick, that you used to put here. Yeah, if anybody would like that a little more macabre version, just send me a note and I can send you that picture. Um, Something about truth in advertising. Back in the early 1900s, it was okay to put cocaine into this popular drink. This is an actual sign. Drink Coca-Cola. It's both numbing and addictive. Drink There's and your advertising. I don't think we need to be drinking too much cocaine, though. It wouldn't be good anymore. All right. Looking forward, Mike. In 2020, you might need to wear one of these in order to come inside school buildings. Oh, boy. I don't know if this is unlearning or relearning or creating something, but this is a facial um, covering. So uh, let's let's talk about why don't you share a little bit about this, Mike? Okay, so Nick and I were talking about, you know, it wasn't Yoda, wasn't Jack Aldrich, it wasn't even George Lucas, but Alvin Toppler is credited with a, a, a sort of a, a mishmash of these words where he's credited with the quote, the illiterate of the 21st century, our century, will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. 
and he wrote this back in like the late 60s, early 70s, so we're going a half century ago, he was looking forward in our, our present, his future, saying that in order to be successful and literate now in our time, got to unlearn. So this has been around and this has been written about and we really believe in it. So now what we want you to do, oh, Nick has something to say. Yeah, let's go, let's go back to the, the question box now. Well, I was no. going to do that. No, okay. Go ahead, Mike. No, you do it. <laughs> now that we've talked about what this is and framed it a little better for you, what do educators need to unlearn? What do we need to unlearn about our systems and our schools and our practices? Go ahead and type them into the questions and Arlen's gonna read those off for us. Okay, here comes from, something from Marissa, the traditional graded classroom. That'll never work in our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a school day entails. Mm -hmm. The way administrators and teachers expect children to learn. Good one too. What we have always done in, print, in quotes. Unlearning what trauma looks like. Mm. Good one. Uh, unlearning the way we were taught. Time constraints. Students sit in seats while teachers teach at them. One solution will solve everything. Mm -hmm. That a nine month school year is obsolete. Lecturing, teacher led classrooms, seat time, what growth looks like, former ways of discipline, and on it goes, guys. Those yeah. are, one, again, thank you. Thank you, Arlen, very much. Thank you, folks, for really jumping up, stepping up, and jumping in. We, these are things that, um, you know, that are really timely and that will really help advance our future in, in public education, private education, and education in general. One of those comments made me think about the concept of, you know, what school looks like today versus uh, the good old days. And, you know, we sometimes we're stuck in the fact that our students, parents, they know what school looks like because they went to school. And so they expect that to be the experience their children have. They don't maybe have the same frame of reference that the world has changed. We're launching these kids out into a very different world than their parents were launched into. And education needs to shift to look different for them too. You know, beyond that though, I mean, the same can be said of our teachers and our counselors and our administrators and our board of education. They all went to school too. They all know what school looks like. And so it takes unlearning leadership in order to, to make that a pervasive thought through the entire school district. So here's a couple examples. Mike, how have we unlearned homework and grading? Well, there's been a ton of, of studies and research and, and thoughts and, and work all around the country. If you look at Hattie's research about the impact or effect of homework as an instructional tool, the effect sizes in the younger grades and the older grades and the upper grades are very different. So it's helping people unlearn the usage and types of homework in the elementary at my level and in the high school at Nick's level. And with grading and assessment and feedback, you've got the formative and summative, you've got letter grades, you've got GPA, you've got weighted grades, you've got standards based. So I'd say we've unlearned certain practices that have been of a deficit model, hopefully, and we've learned and relearned some asset models to show growth and learning. Um, this is certainly a work in progress in my world um, but it's definitely been a, a really hot topic. How about communication, Mike? How have we unlearned communication? Well, first, I would say we should not drive on the wrong side of the road. Um, that's something, you know, that I would, I would advocate for. And if you're going to use a rotary dial, it may be difficult getting a signal on some of the VoIP systems. But um, what we've really unlearned is that communication may be waiting for a letter coming in the post mails box in the mailbox. We may have um, un, you know, learned that this is a telephone where you make phone calls, although phone calls are making a resurgence during this current time. We've really unlearned that communication may be something that is passive or asynchronous. And we also may have unlearned that communication um, operates in a box or a window. I believe now communication has become ubiquitous with our being and our presence 
and our world flattening use of social media as an example. Well, when you think about the previous slide in this one, when when teachers use tools like uh, Google Docs mm -hmm. for students to submit work, I hear stories all the time that a teacher happens to be in grading papers at the same time a student is in working on a paper, and all of a sudden a conversation will pop up in the chat between the student and teacher working through part of the paper. And I think that's an interesting phenomenon, but it's also a little bit of a scary phenomenon because I want our te I don't know that I want our teachers feeling like they have to work 24 hours a day and, and answer questions like that. Certainly some want to and enjoy that and find value in it, but uh, we have to be careful of expectations and, and make sure we're not burning people out at the same time. You know, and I think that leads us into the teachers. You know, how is how are we unlearning the workforce? Mike says all the time, we have people working in our schools that are in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, and even up into their 70s and 80s. And so how are we responsive to the differences in all the people that we work with and that we serve? Uh, if you've ever had a chance to visit a Google office, mm -hmm. and we've been able to be to a few in a few different states and countries, there's some commonalities in the unique things they do in terms of accessibility to food and drinks, even accessibility to alcohol in the workplace, which we don't uh, actually advocate for in schools. But there's napping pods and places to get your nails done and drop your dog off. There are all kinds of you know ping pong tables and arcade machines, and they're catering to a different workforce. When you look at our schools, how have we changed to cater to the changing workforce? And I think in a lot of ways, the answer is not much. Um, one of the things we're doing at Leiden is uh, next year, we're gonna open up a preschool and daycare that's very affordable, that our staff can use for their children. And uh, we think it's gonna be a teacher recruitment and teacher retention tool for us into the future. But we're rethinking some of our spaces and our approaches to resource allocation to meet the needs of the workforce. So about six years ago, uh, Nick and I uh, created um, SUPT chat, soup chat, um, which is a chat on Twitter for anybody really. It was designed for superintendents to stay in touch and now it's educational leaders, teachers, board members, anybody interested. The first Wednesday of every month and in our book, The Unlearning Leader, where we really talk about unlearning, unlearning leadership and we talk about how to scale changes um, from the classroom level to the school level to the district level and beyond we also have an end of chapter feature that's um you know stop understand plan think and in the book we talk about other educational chats that are out there to sort of help people understand this is a a new way or, or a relearned way to communicate and to get professional development out there um and when it comes to using twitter nick and i also use our own district hashtags um, and on the next slide, you'll see that if you go to Leiden Pride for Nick's school district, or if you go to 112 Leeds for my school district, any day of the week, any time of day, you're going to see the story of, the narrative of, the messaging of what it is that we're doing and we're real proud of using Twitter as that medium. Um, so whether you use a chat, whether you use a hashtag, whether you use it to communicate with people on the other side of the world, or all of the above, it's a way that we unlearned that communication only took place in person. And boy, we miss in-person communication now, believe me, but it's unlearning that there's one way to grow, unlearning that there's one way to learn, and relearning that there's many ways to do it. Um, Nick, what's the greatest enemy to unlearning? The greatest enemy to unlearning is TWA-D. And what is TWA-D? Well, Wadi is that's the way we've always done it. That's the way we always do it. That's the way we always did it. And somebody, some folks mentioned that or touched upon that, I think, in the question box on our last prompt. And so, you know, Mike, I, I want you to give some examples from your district about how you're overcoming this concept of that's the way we always did it. Uh, if we have time, we can share some more global examples. But okay. would you mind jumping in? No, not at all. Do me a favor. Um, let's go to slide 40. Now, go, go to 41. So I'm going to give you a brief history of North Shore School District 112 in Highland Park in Highwood, Illinois. So on this slide, you see a timeline, um, snapshots from our district. Our motto is inspire, innovate, and engage. The district was born in 1993, reluctantly, 
due to the um, consolidation of three districts. One district, I had financial troubles and was going out of business. The next contiguous district by law was going to take it over and decided that if the two of them banded together, they can get the third district involved and the third district didn't want to. So the district was born out of um, controversy, contention and frustration and some negativity. Flash forward to 2010. So in 2010, there was a new strategic plan. You had a superintendent about five or six superintendents ago in 2010 um, had a new strategic plan and the focus was going to be to modernize finances, modernize education, the facilities. All right. In 2014, they selected a new superintendent. They had great ideas. They built stuff together. In 2016, they tried to have a $205 million referendum to really move boundaries and move the cheese and consolidate and do all this stuff. And it failed. It failed in 2016 so much so that in 2017, two co-interim superintendents and um, new board members, because board members quit too. Go to the next slide if you could, 42. So in slide 42, you see that in 2016, failed a referendum, really broke the communities apart. No superintendent, board president quit, another board member left. In 2017, they hired two interim superintendents for 18 months. In 2018, they selected a new superintendent, that's me. And we came in and we basically said, we're gonna unlearn the past. We're gonna unlearn failure. We're gonna unlearn victim mentality. We're gonna unlearn um, being the vanquished. And we are going to relearn unity and coherence. We're gonna relearn winning, excellence, focus. And we're going to learn how to be a stable school district modernizing within our means and in a period of, uh, of the last two years uh, pre-COVID we stabilized the school district we had a, a very very nice and non-controversial board election we um, uh, decided to re-modernize and rebuild the two middle schools equitable investment of dollars because all the students in the schools get to go to these middle schools and even with COVID We've stayed together, we've stayed focused, and we're really doing a nice job in terms of transformation and building relationships. Go to the next slide and take a deep breath. This particular slide shows you the ages of the facilities to just give you a real drop in the snapshot about how we have to unlearn that old, you know, William Howard Taft era, Grover Cleveland era, Franklin Delano Roosevelt era, even Richard Nixon era buildings are equipped to support modern learning. And that's how we're modernizing our two middle schools. But the real short answer is we unlearned failure and we unlearned incoherence and we unlearned um, victimization. We learned how to go forward, how to unite, how to be coherent, and we relearned what excellence is. We reached out to our community and said, okay, some of you are still angry, you want this. Some of you are still angry, you want this. What do we all believe in though? And as you can see on the screen, all of our community stakeholders believe they want equity, powerful word, powerful concept. They want instruction and curriculum to be at the forefront. They want teachers and staff who are excellent, and we have excellent teachers and staff. They want 21st century facilities. We're modernizing both middle schools, and they want a consistent curriculum. So when you come in, you can predict where we're gonna go. And quite frankly, I'm really proud that in a few short years, we not only have modernization, which is shown on the next slide, the new Northwood is being built, and then, Nick, I want to take a break from my voice on slide 46. Will you show this modern uh, portrait of a graduate? Not this one. Next slide. Will you show this student narrated story of what a portrait of a graduate is? And then that'll sort of close this unlearning lesson in our school district. Maybe. Either one is good. Thanks, bud. To plan today for a prayer tomorrow for District 112, a group of students, parents, and educators have established a set of attributes that define an aspirational vision for District 112 students. These attributes include having the knowledge to find and evaluate information, 
the perseverance to learn new concepts and innovate. The empathy to embrace diverse perspectives and be open to new ideas. The courage to make positive change on a local, national, and global level. The desire to not only meet expectations, but to exceed them both as a person and student. The confidence to take risks, keep trying, and own the results of our learning. and the commitment to always ask questions, search for better answers, and stay curious. Learn more about how students, parents, and staff are building the future for District 112 at ncsd112.org slash modern learning. Four years ago, the district was on the brink of, of civil war, so newspaper headlines said, and today we've got students helping tell our story to lead the way with some of the finest teachers, support staff, board members, and administrators, and parents you'd ever want to find. Thank you, Nick, for letting me tell a couple of unlearning stories from North Shore School District 112. So, you know, Mike mentioned Soup Chat, and we'd love to invite all of you. All are welcome. You don't have to be a superintendent. We, we get folks from all across the country, all across the world, that jump on for about 45 minutes, um, just once a month. And uh, we have great conversations, learn from each other, expand our, our, our learning networks, our PLNs. Um, but let's, let's talk about, I wanna talk about a statewide example of unlearning and then a very localized down to a single teacher, single student example to really drive this home uh, as, we're, as we're starting to run a little late in the webinar. Back in 2014, we had one of the coldest winters in Illinois and we canceled school a whole bunch because of wind chill and snow. And I was sitting at work one day during one of those wind chills, and I saw on Twitter a superintendent in the state of Indiana tweeting about his district's e-learning plans. And I thought, boy, I wonder what they're doing. So I sent him a direct message. Within a half hour, he and I were on the phone with each other. And then he emailed me the copy of the legislation that created e-learning in the state of Indiana. I partnered up with another superintendent in Illinois we brought that language to a legislator in Illinois, and the very next year, the state created the pilot for e-learning days. And so Leiden, West Chicago High School, and Gurney Elementary jumped in, and I can tell you from since 2014, I have not called a single snow day or cold day. We've always done e-learning days, and boy, was that beneficial come this year. When we needed to flip the switch to remote e-learning for the rest of the school year, our students, our parents, our teachers had already had some, uh, some experience with this. This is a picture of our website from back in 2018 on one of our e-learning days during February. But the, the power of your network and the willingness to connect with others and think differently, for us, it meant creating legislation, driving to Springfield and testifying in front of committees and saying, this is good. We can do, if we continue education instead of canceling for snow, um, there are benefits to this. And that has now been opened up to the entire state. That's a global example. But I want to tell you a story about, um, about a student. His name is Fabian. And uh, Leiden, uh, you saw in the video, ha has a very large Latinx population. F we also have a very large Eastern European population, first and second generation students, because of our proximity to O'Hare. So Fabian moved to the United States from Poland and uh, was a freshman at Leiden and was in a pre-engineering class. He was in a Project Lead the Way class. And there was a few weeks left in the school year. And Fabian uh, said to his teacher, Frank Holdhouse, Mr. Holdhouse, I'm done with all my projects. What do you want me to do? And I want you to think about the lens of a teacher now. Frank could have said to him, you know what, put your head down. Why don't you go help the other kids with their projects? You can work on work from other classes. He could have said any number of things. But Frank said to Fabian, what do you want to do? And almost without hesitating, Fabian gave the most ridiculously specific answer uh, you could possibly give. He said, I want to use the 3D printers to make a model of the school. And Frank said, go ahead. So Fabian got to it. He started looking at Google Earth images of the building and he couldn't figure out the scale. And so he went across the street with a measuring tape and measured one of the houses that was in the image to create a scale factor for the building. He mounted a GoPro camera on the top of his mom's car and had her drive around the building 
to capture video. He couldn't drive, he was 14. And he started to use the video and the images and he coded in all of those components and made a 3D model, 3D printed model of the school down to every window, every door. He went on the building and on the roof and measured the uh, HVAC units. When he was all done, he presented that model to Jason Markey, the principal of East Leiden, and said, here, this is for you. But there was still time left in the year. And so Fabian went and, and redid that process for West Leiden High School. In about a third of the time, he created a, a full model of West Leiden, presented it to that principal who had uh, he'd never met before. So it was about this time, the year was coming to a close, Mike and I got invited to the White House. I may have mentioned that to you. I called Fabian into my office and I said, hey, I've heard these stories about you and your 3D printing. I've, I have this opportunity to go to the White House. Would you be willing to make me a 3D model of the White House? And he said, sure. So he jumped in, he followed the same processes. I don't think he drove around the White House, that might not have worked well, but he made me a 3D model of the White House with an East Wing and a West Wing. I carried that on the airplane, had to explain to the Secret Service agents what it was, let the dogs sniff it, and I brought it in. And this is me in the White House delivering it to the Deputy Director of Innovation, who then gave it to President Obama. And the entire thing was live streamed on social media so that Fabian could watch from back at school. And it was one of the most amazing things. And if the story stopped right there, it'd be a pretty cool story. But that spark that was lit in Fabian has yet to go out. He came uh, the next year, sophomore year, he came to my office one day and met with my assistant and said, can I make an appointment with Dr. Poliak? And so they said it, he came into my office and he said, could I make a presentation to the school board? And I said, sure, what do you wanna present? And he said, uh, the most scary thing a superintendent can hear, he said, it's a surprise. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I, I owe the kid one. So I put him on the board agenda. I show up to the board meeting and there in the room is something covered by a sheet. We get to that part of the agenda. I announce Fabian. He steps up, he removes the sheet, and there is a fully 3D printed, fully operational violin with a pickup. And uh, if, you, if you know music, he picked it up, he introduced himself to the board, and he played Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. He apologized to the board because he wasn't very good. See, so he had just learned, taught himself to play the violin over the last three weeks on YouTube. He's a cellist. And so the board's you know, their jaws hit the floor. I immediately asked for a new contract and got one. And then uh, fast forward to Fabian senior year. You know, you talk about kids learning and finding their passion and being resilient. Once again, he came to me and said, can I present to the board again? And he wanted to come to the March board meeting. And I said, sure, is it a surprise again? He goes, no, this time I found a company with a bigger printer in Chicago and I'm gonna th 3D print a working cello. So I said, absolutely. I put him on the agenda and about a week before the board meeting, he came in and he said, well, my cello is done. I wanted it to look professional. So I took it to an auto detailing shop and asked them to paint it the way they paint the cars. So it shines. And they did. They wanted to charge him 500 bucks. He talked them down to 200. They painted it, they put it in. And one of the guys saw it and put it into the room where they fire the paint to harden it and melted his cello to the ground. He's telling me this story in the, you know, and I'm about tearing up. And he said, it's okay, Dr. Poliak. Um, can I present at the May meeting instead? And Fabian went on to create that cello, uh, to present it. He, uh, he went on full ride scholarship to college. He's now aeronautical engineering at Lewis University. He comes back and volunteers at the high school. He, uh, he's made us new models, bigger models of the high schools, and he found his passion. And I love telling that story, but I always have to bring it back to the beginning. Where did it start? One single teacher unlearning. This was not in the curriculum. 3D printing a high school was not in the curriculum. He put the curriculum aside and found the passion of the student and nurtured it and encouraged it, and the kid just blossomed. And so if you take away one thing from our talk today, it's about the power of unlearning and that it can happen at any level. You think about this. The, the limitations that we live in are in our minds. If we use our imagination and we're, we give permission to ourselves and to others, the possibilities become limitless. So Mike, do you wanna mention the video we have at the end here? Yes, 
<clears throat> so we'll we'll show you the link again and we'll show you our contact information and we want you to walk away um, in a few moments with the question are you a leader of yesterday today or tomorrow and um, don't just take our word for unlearning and don't just you know take our book that you can download on Amazon or anything you also might want to check out this eight minute video the backwards brain bicycle some of you may have seen it it's it's a guy who's an engineer who does an experiment about unlearning how to ride a bike you know we've all grown up with the saying it's as easy as riding a bike don't worry just get right back on the bike it's worth your eight minutes and we strongly encourage you to do so nick do me a favor show them the link um in case they want if you want the slides there's the web address there's the qr code um, in a minute nick's going to put up our contact information and we're going to give you a few minutes if you have any questions or comments we would love to hear you. Um, you can put them in the question box. Carlin will share it. Also, um, Nick and I are on Twitter. If you want to do the um, slide 53, so you can you can give us a shout out on Twitter. Um, really, are you a leader of yesterday, today, or tomorrow? And we we want to embolden you with the power to unlearn, so that our children and our future can be that much better. So I'll pause for that. So. Um, about 52, 53 minutes into the webinar. I want to give you a chance to take a breath and ask some questions. Really appreciate you spending time with us today. It's um, it's, it's wonderful. Arlen, any questions or comments coming up that we should yes, address? Absolutely. We've had quite active, a lot of good activity here in the questions box. Nick, Mike, I want to thank you both so much for sharing your stories and strategies. It's very inspirational stuff. Um, so let's hear what the audience had to say. Um, Jordan says, I noticed the design and style of the learning spaces in your schools. What effect size do you feel the structure slash style of a classroom has on learning and student creation? It's an amazing question. I will tell you, I don't know what the effect size, but I will say this. We're putting our money where our mouth is. And in our district, we're investing um, $75 million in two modernized middle schools with an architecture firm that has an eye on this design and um, i've talked to designers like david jakes over the years so i don't know the effect size nick might know but i do know that rethinking and reshaping where learning takes place in a facility and in a structure enhances the excitement and the feeling and sort of the empowerment of a child which definitely is having a more positive and more inviting and more inspiring environment nick yeah, I'll just add, um, I don't have research to cite, but I will say that as we um, as we change over classrooms, we're getting rid of the traditional 30 desks and columns and rows, and we're going to collaboration stations with monitors on the walls. And so we have peninsula tables that butt up to the wall and a monitor and kids can plug their Chromebooks in, but we're trying to specifically use furniture and classroom design to drive collaboration, communication, uh, teamwork, innovation, and so you can't you can't drive and have kids look directly at the at the blackboard anymore. That's not how our classrooms are built. We're building them so that kids can collaborate with one another, and that's one of the lessons we learned at Google. You know, they always tell us, you know, if there's a if there's a project to be done, you know, if you if you complete the project and go back and tell your boss, yep, I didn't talk to anybody else, didn't work with anybody, this is all my work, you're going to get in trouble. The world is a collaborative world. So we're trying to create classrooms and schools that are collaborative. Excellent, thank you both. Uh, Angela says, you might be getting to this, but what strategies have you found helpful in addressing uh, trois D coming from parents slash community, such as claims that the new way is messing with tradition or devaluing education? Such a powerful question. Well, I've learned the hard way over the years through doing it wrong um, and for uh, slipping and tripping and getting back up, so um, <laughs> the wrong way is not involving parents at the beginning and bringing them in midpoint. The right way is bringing in parents from the beginning, from the inception, and listening, learning, talking, growing, sharing, and not being, um, you know, um, willful in your leadership, but instead being willing in your leadership, willing to really join people where they are share your thoughts, share the research, share the ideas, share, share some possibilities, scale slowly and small, and then exponentially grow. Um, so involve everybody from the beginning. Um, 
And remember, not everybody is as fluent in educational research or the idea just because you're all jazzed up. Take some time. There's no rush. We've been at this for hundreds of years. What's another, you know, six months or so? Get everybody at the same table. Yeah, Harlan, I think he handled that one well. I'll let you throw another one out. Okay, yes, just looking through. Uh, letting people know, yes, the recording will be made available tomorrow to all registrants and participants. I'll be sending that out. Um, here's a question from Josh. How have you been challenged and overcome other educators who are unable to unlearn that's the way we've always done it practices? I guess we kind of answered that question already, didn't we? Yeah, but that's that's a very that's the question we get everywhere first every single time because it's the reality of our world. We we need to from whatever leadership post you're in, you need to model it, you need to encourage it and celebrate it. Um, because people people are worried. They they know I'm supposed to do this or that. We're we're good soldiers. We do what we're told, we do it well. That's what makes us successful. You need to turn that on its ear and celebrate risk taking, celebrate people trying something different and, and iterating again and again to make it better. All right, we've got time for one more here. Uh, this one comes from Jordan. Do you have any specific examples of unlearning being applied to student discipline and attendance? Um, yeah, no, you're gonna laugh. Nick knows where I'm gonna go with this one. Let's see, hold on. That'll be in another webinar that we do. And some of that's covered in student voice from invisible to invaluable. That's a shout out for our buddy PJ Kaposi. Serious answer is yes. And I'm gonna tell you, it sounds simple, but it's so true. Making sure that the students are part of the decision-making and the leadership in let's just say discipline in this case, attendance in the other case. And do we have examples of how to do it? Yeah, um, we do. Nick, wouldn't you, would you concur? Yeah, I mean, there's there's all kinds of research out about restorative practices and and circles and and, and getting to the core of what's causing behavioral issues and discipline issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I think we're all pretty well versed in that in education these days. I think it all comes down to relationships. Yeah. When a kid has a trusted adult in that building, when they have an accountability partner, whether it's another student or an adult that they know looks out for them and they respect, it's it's the kids who are disconnected that are the ones that are your chronic truants or your discipline. I mean, obviously there are medical issues and other things that can crop up and cause those things. But generally speaking, kids that don't have a solid relationship with an adult are the ones that we see drift away and the ones that we see misbehave. The kids that are connected, they're into sports and clubs and they have a coach and a sponsor that they, and kids that count on them, those are the kids that are gonna show up every day. Awesome, thank you. That's Erlen, great. thanks for the shout outs. Nick, do you wanna just put the slide up as a few people are still still in the, in the in the game here? This one? Yep. Arlen, this has been an absolute treat, an absolute pleasure to be with you. We can't thank you enough. Yeah, I wanna thank you both so much for sharing and being with us today. Wonderful information for our participants. Um, I wanna remind everybody, as again, this is gonna be recorded and a link will be sent to you tomorrow. As, long, as well as a link to an evaluation that once completed will generate the ISBE evidence of completion form. So you will get one hour of professional development credit if you made it through to the entire uh, end of the webinar. You are now free to close the GoToWebinar control panel and that will log you out of the session. Take care everybody and hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody, Thank goodbye. So